All right, last talk of the day. And then we get to talk to all of our speakers outside with a bunch of drinks. And I know all of you are been very patient here. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our next speaker, Ilya. Ilya is the co-founder of Near Protocol. And some of you have seen Near Protocol, some of you have heard of it. Some of you have heard of what Ilya has done in the past before starting Near. We'll cover all of that and what the future looks like of multi-chain world in the next 60 seconds. Welcome. Oh, well, we'll cover starting that. There you go. Don't worry. I'm also tired. But please welcome Ilya from Nier. It's been a long day. I know. I was talking with Mr. Carter yesterday. I'm like, you're going to be on stage seven hours. Like, I assure you this is good for you. It seemed like a good idea last night. <laughs> well, I want to cover a lot of the blockchain stuff. I want to also cover a lot of how we should think about Near versus Ethereum versus all the other chains that are out there and, and what that world looks like on scalability. But uh, I want to start off by asking you, what did you do before starting Near? And uh, and you should tell the audience kind of how you got into this space and what made you start Near. Yeah. So my background is actually in machine learning, and uh, uh, I got kind of excited about it very early on. Uh, I think somebody asked me what's my f like favorite movie from uh, kind of teenage years, and I responded, "Artificial Intelligence." And so, uh, not I, a lot of good IMDb ratings on that one, but it was a good movie. It was a good movie, and uh, definitely kind of led to to a lot of uh, thinking from there. And so, um, I've been working for about ten years in machine learning. I've done a bunch of like projects, uh, kind of across you know everything from cancer research to insurance to uh, finding oil uh, and then I joined uh, Google research to work on natural language because I actually think natural language is the best way to represent knowledge um, and uh, apparently that's true now that we <laughs> I think a, a chatbot here would agree yeah and so at Google research I worked on if you search for stuff on google.com and saw kind of short answers for this, like our, our kind of team was powering uh, a bunch of that, uh, everything from like lists to actual like short answers. Um, and uh, I worked on TensorFlow, which is machine learning framework, um, got really kind of, whenever I saw open source, I'm like, I need to work on that. <laughs> um, and uh, I ended up kind of through being uh, in kind of, it was actually a funny story because the whole attention is all you need came from lunch. So it was a lunch conversation. Okay, that's a, that's a story I don't think I've heard before either. So yeah, it's, let, it's let's a, hear this. It's not, yeah, it's not a well-known story, but yeah, it was a lunch conversation. So, I mean, the context was uh, we, were, we were building a lot of kind of recurrent neural networks. So uh, if you're not familiar with neural networks, it's kind of you're processing one thing at a time. And so it ends up being very slow and very unstable. So it's like easy to kind of really hard to train. And so in result, we, we couldn't launch anything like that in google.com or translate uh, because it was too slow to kind of do inference. Um, and so instead, everybody was doing just bag of words. So we like, which is just, you know, you literally don't have a sequence of words in your model. Like it's not considering sequence of words. You literally like just take a sentence, split it into words and feed that into a model with, without any order, uh, which was working surprisingly well. <laughs> we didn't um, notice on Google that I don't think you would notice anywhere else. <laughs> and so, and so the idea of transformers originally was, uh, so we used it the, like there was a concept of attention, which was um, kind of pioneered by like uh, a year or, or year and a half before that. And it was like, well, what if you use bag of words and attention together? Like, can attention actually recover the sequence and 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 in Instead, be the power instead of the recurrent neural networks. So that was like a lunch conversation. And so I went back, kind of, you know, hacked something together. And like, it was not not noise. And so then like uh, me and Ashish and like others, like we, we started kind of trying to bring it to life and see if it works. That's and awesome. So it turns out that attention was all you needed. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, for, for those in the audience, um, he, he's being a bit humble. Attention is all you need is the actual invention of transformers, which is what powers all these LLMs and OpenAI and ChatGPT and everything else. He's one of the authors and inventor of that concept. 
And uh, and that was almost five years ago. Yeah, it was 2017. Uh, this was like uh, beginning. Six years ago. Yeah. yeah. And so, and seeing that come to life now and everybody kind of finally realizing what you can do with LLMs is, is insane. So inventing transformers and then something in the middle and we have near <laughs> how that happened. Yeah, so uh, so paired up with my co-founder Alex Kidanov, and uh, kind of I wanted to do something like we had kind of transformers. I always wanted to do code synthesis. Uh, so for those not familiar, it's what GitHub Copilot is. And so we kind of started near AI pretty much to build GitHub Copilot five years ago. Five years ago, without Microsoft money or GitHub data. Uh, and so. Uh, what we did was uh, our competitive programming background, and so we got a lot of data from that. And then we had all of the students around the world actually working for us, adding more data. And so we, uh, and the challenge we had was actually paying them, because we had students in China, in Russia, in Ukraine, and kind of all those countries which have monetary control, pro like the U.S. capital control. Yeah. yeah, capital control. You're sending money from U.S. to those countries, like complicated some the students didn't have bank accounts uh and so the crypto was like hey you, we have this global payment network that everybody's talking about uh, and this was like um you know beginning of 2018 um like can we use that uh and the answer was no you cannot because it's like way too expensive for what we're doing way too complicated even for developers to figure out how to use it it's like hey before you can receive money install metamask and fund it you're like, wait, with money. We paying people to to do stuff. Can we like pre-fund it for them? It's like, no, you cannot. Like they need to have their wallet. It's like so so that was all kind of uh drivers like this doesn't seem like the way it should work. The idea is great. A lot of concepts are great, but like it doesn't work. And so we started dig digging in and trying to figure out like how should this work? Who is working on this? What are the kind of ideas in the space? And so that's uh, when we met uh, Vitalik, we met Justin Drake. We, uh, we started also meeting all the other kind of protocols as well, diving in uh, how it works. And at the end, we haven't found anyone who's trying to make set of trade-offs that we believed uh, are right, which, by the way, very similar to what uh, kind of flow is uh, uh, thinking about, which are how do we make it really simple to use for like people who don't know anything about blockchain and shouldn't? How do we make it really simple to build and kind of as available to anyone, uh, to any developer without needing to learn like new concepts? And then how do we make it really secure and and scalable to billions of users, right? So that like it actually linearly scales as more usage comes in. Um, the, the kind of analogy I like to use is that, you know, Netflix never like asks you to pay more because like other people are watching the same movie. So, uh, That's a great analogy. <laughs> so like it should just scale underneath and Uber does. Well, <laughs> maybe they need the better that better. Like, I think they were working on autonomous driving that was supposed to solve that. No. So anyway, so that was kind of the, the origin of near, uh, we ended up doing a really, if you haven't seen a whiteboard series, which was a really cool, um, way to learn about what everybody else in the space are doing. And so we interviewed everyone from, uh, you know, Cosmos, from Ethereum, from Solana, uh, uh, Polkadot. So there's like over 50 episodes. Uh, Filecoin is there as well. And really diving in into like how technically the their protocol is working and really kind of what are the concepts and what are the trade-offs. Um, and so that gave us a lot of understanding. And uh, as we were designing Near, we were kind of understanding very well what are the trade-offs we're taking and also... Uh, kind of how that compares to the whole space. Yeah, you know, I want to kind of interject here for, for a second because this seems like a, such a casual thing that you're saying, but three years ago, we had to invent a lot of these things and hope that they worked in production the way they work in theory. And uh, this kind of applied to anybody who launched a blockchain, anybody who kind of played with different consensus algorithms, which is different ways to think about scaling. So. It feels like, oh, of course it would work, or this is a given now to everybody who's coming in, but this was crazy five years ago. People were still skeptical of E2 and sharding, and, and we've kind of seen iterations on all that too. So maybe before we kind of dive in, what were kind of the, some of the things that you either ended up inventing or iterating on from existing computer science problems that kind of led to near being what it is now? Yeah, so, I mean, the kind of 
the underlying question pretty much is one computer, like the blockchain usually relies that there is one computer uh, that, you know, produces a block and then everybody else validates it. Meaning like they kind of replay the block, execute transactions and get to the same result as everybody else. And so in, re in reality, you ended up with capacity of one computer. So you cannot do more work than what one computer can do. And this is even without consensus overhead, right? This is literally like, we, if we assume, you know, there's no networking lags, there's no like need to wait for agreement. It's just like you execute as fast as one computer can do. And obviously that's limiting and uh, there's other, other sets of uh, kind of limitations. Then you add consensus, which is, well, if we need to wait for an agreement before we can produce next block, that's extra latency and in turn less, uh, uh, less throughput to the network. And then on top of it, you have the problem of uh, kind of VM execution and actually the real problem is storage. Because if you want to have authenticated uh, kind of storage, right, and what this means is in blockchains, you can verify that this piece of state, right, your balance, you can verify that indeed you have this much Ether or whatever token in your account. And there's a proof for that and it's kind of consensus proven. This And so to do that, we actually store it in so-called kind of authenticated database, right? Which means there's a proof for each piece of data. And that is very expensive. Meaning if you have, you know, a million records, you actually need like 10 writes and 10 reads for any single piece of data to write or read. So it's like log, That's log, it's log, yeah, log n pretty much uh, complexity for computer science students here. And so, so that's a very expensive, right? Because there's, you know, if you have a transaction that touches like hundred pieces of state, that's, you know, can be like a thousand reads of disk, which is really expensive, even with SS SSDs. And so, so all, these are all the kind of problem. If you decompose a blockchain, this is, a, you know, this, the storage, VM execution, can, uh, uh, kind of consensus. And then like the fact that you only running on one machine. And so the way to solve this is, you know, kind of work on each of these layers and figure out how to remove the bottlenecks. And so starting from the top, the um, kind of the single machine thing is how do we have multiple machines running in parallel, executing transaction in parallel, ordering transactions, executing transaction in parallel. Then how do you pipeline consensus in such a way that it doesn't have a lag, right? So ideally, at any point of time, somebody is producing next block. And, exec and while, while somebody produces the next block, you're executing the previous block, right? So that you don't wait like while you execute to produce next block. And on kind of VM level, how do we optimize performance that's as close to native? And on storage level, how do we kind of remove the bottlenecks? And, and when, you know, when we talk about writes, how do we pipeline writes so we don't need to wait for them? And for reads, how do we have ideally in memory or at least like flat data storage that we can read from? So this is all kind of pieces, right? And like from there, you need to like really build a thing that works. <laughs> combining them is not. Yeah, yeah. Combining, yeah. And like the specific, the sharding part, like the running things in parallel is hard because usually when people come to blockchain, they expect this atomic execution, right? They expect that if I send a transaction and it touches a bunch of contracts or apps, if something goes wrong, the whole thing rolls back. And you cannot achieve that if you have multiple kind of parallel execution happening, right? It's the same kind of going from, you know, a single threaded application to a multi-threaded application. Now you need to think about kind of locks and complexity around that. And so that was one of the core trade-offs, right? Which, uh, you know, with layer twos, with uh, Polkadot, like the decision was different. The decision was like, well, why don't we have still this like single threaded applications, uh, but just but we just like have a bunch of them and we, and then we figure out how, and the users and developers figure out how this should work. Right. And like, from our perspective, you know, I started with simple and secure uh, and secure and scalable, right? The simple was the important part. And this is not simple. This is like makes complexity surface to the user and saying like, Hey, do you know which layer two you're on or app chain you're on or power chain you're on or zone or whatever? Like you need to know like which security it has, which like, you know, who's running it. Is it is it a how overhead is never does you know. it have all the Ethereum in the account to actually submit blocks? Like you should probably monitor that as a user. And so so that's the complexity that like uh kind of the other trade-off has. And we we wanted to remove that and user not think about it. 
And in turn, it meant that we have each account, each contract to be running in parallel as well. So we don't have this atomicity on a transaction level, we have it on an account level. I mean, that's a very hard problem to solve with locks and just making sure this is globally consistent. Um, we won't get into how you solved it because uh, so that's a, there's a video <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you the YouTube so like, link. Uh, but obviously, this is now. We know that it's it's working and and it works great. So let's go into understanding what is now enabled by these primitives becoming more accessible. Uh, from whether it's from the NEARS perspective or just the Web3 ecosystem overall, what are kind of some of the themes that you're seeing that are now evolving and becoming more and more possible? To For build sure, on? yeah. I think kind of probably the to finish the story, right? The, so we started with layer one. We really kind of focused on making it simple to use. So we did a lot about account abstractions kind of early on as well, making our accounts extremely flexible and powerful. Um, it's like everything from, you know, multiple keys to turning them into contracts back into accounts. Somebody just launched turning account into NFT and back as well. So you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with them. Uh, we have WebAssembly, so you can run Rust, JavaScript, Python, whatever you want as a smart contract. Um, new compiler can run and compile for that as well. Cadence. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, and we have sharding, right, to actually uh, scale. And so the kind of the next step of that was, and like it was funny to, I mean, kind of look at Powerloom before because yeah, it's like the next problem is, okay, well now you have all this blockchain, but that's the data is in completely different shape, right? The usual database problem, data is always in the wrong shape for your application. And so uh, how do like, we kind of worked on indexers and different frameworks and APIs and SDKs on top of it to really power it. And now that we have that, the next step came in, which is, well, there's a lot of smart developers who build interesting applications. There's people who are actually creating really interesting uh, things, but they don't have like a full story of like product onboarding, kind of all of the pieces together, right? They usually don't think about it uh, at least yet. And so how do we power that more? And kind of the evolution that we came up with we call it blockchain operating system. It's really an idea that right now we have kind of blockchains, which are really kind of almost like hardware, right? They have like a very low level uh, APIs. They kind of provide a very low level, uh, you know, primitives of asset ownership, of uh, kind of um, business logic that you can program for. And as well, we have a lot of them. So we have like fragmentation as well across. But as a user, you don't really care about that. You just want to go, like, you know, use some app, you want trade some NFTs, you know, play some games, uh, you know, swap some tokens, not caring about slippage and MEV and all this stuff, right? And so, so that's a disconnect. And as well as, like, as a user, you want a product. You don't want a, you know, one app that gives you, like, one feature, like Uniswap. Like, you want a product that gives you notifications, you can search for stuff, you can, like, interact with it, you can find dashboards, you can do all those things in kind of one place. And so blockchain operating system is really connecting all those pieces together. It abstracts kind of blockchain complexity with all of the data layer, as well as meta transactions, as well as uh, kind of indexing and things like that. And then on the other side, it, it creates a user journey, right? It onboards users, we call a thing called fast auth, five seconds, you sign up as an email, you get a named account, you can use your apps. You don't need to pay fees, you don't need to figure out what like zero X something means, you don't need seed phrases, like all that is abstracted out. Uh, you have d discovery, which is decentralized front ends. So this is turning what smart contracts did to services, doing that to front ends as well, making them decentralized, really composable, kind of living on blockchain, but in turn being rendered and kind of creating this very powerful developer environment in which you can kind of navigate from one app to another inside the same uh, kind of platform. And so for those who, like you mentioned Facebook and Zynga before, like that's just what Facebook was kind of before. It's like a platform on which you can build new apps really easily and then they kind of close it off. So this is the open version of that. Like everything is open source. You can fork any any other application as well and build on top of it. And uh, uh, you can spin up your own version of this and kind of showcase how it works. You have search notifications and kind of all of the services as well that like users are used to. 
and kind of packaged all in one kind of really like powerful platform that everybody can use. And so that's kind of where we see this evolving is really like we still, you know, truly preserving the principles of Web3, of user ownership, of decentralization, of anyone kind of being able to run their own version of this as well. But the applications, the front ends, the data, everything is common. And so it doesn't matter which gateway you come from, you go through near.org or boss.gg or potentially in some brands going to support this, you can actually navigate to the same apps. Like it doesn't matter where you start. And so we're kind of turning around the, this problem that decentralization meant you have no distribution because nobody can find anything to really decentralization actually means you have more distribution because now every channel that installs this operating system can navigate well, to the same apps. apps. Yeah. And so that's why, again, like going back to this operating system uh, analogy, you know, as you get more installations, right, you now have bigger platform for these applications to be used. And the important part is like it works as any blockchain, right? You can, you, you, like we have people uh, running on layer twos on Ethereum. Uh, folks are adding other like Cosmos chains as well. And so it kind of spans like the specific, you know, also I call it a religion. Like instead of like, hey, you need to convert to my religion. Whichever cult you're part of yeah, at the time. To like, hey, this is just solving people's problems, right? For DeFi, this is decentralized front end such that you don't need to run and maintain front end and be on the hook, right? For uh, other applications, like, hey, this is a quick discovery because all the users right away can access this and not need to connect, right? You have, you know, social features that are already embedded there. You have kind of all those pieces really coming together in one platform. So, and the, like to your question, like this is where we see this evolving is really like this kind of becoming more of a ubiquitous platform that leverages different Web3 technologies under the hood. But as a user, you're just navigating it and using it. That sounds like a pretty good, pretty good pitch. It's almost like I've practiced like yeah. 50 times in the past three weeks, but yeah. You may not realize this thing, but we did plan a lot of this. So, uh, not not the talk. Uh, we're not that coordinated. But how we get to this conclusion, why this talk is the last one. Uh, part of kind of the goal for today for Pragma was to kind of tell people about what you should be actually looking forward to in the next couple of years. And if there's one thing you kind of take away from this, it's the fact that things are going to be on chain. And that's just, you need to accept that because that is great for everybody. You get so many brand new features. And you get to optimize for things that we are currently suffering from. A lot of that is distribution and portability of information, which is what decentralization actually solves because it gives you the ability to exit. We kind of start off in the morning with talking about what's actually happening on chain to get a lot of users to get into crypto for the first time. That's what blue rabbit hole. We saw a lot of information around, okay, now that you have some information about a user, how do we actually tie all of that into actions? Uh, that was tally. Uh, especially with Powerloom, which is the last demo, it was, okay, now you have people's information, you know who the users are, you want to be able to tie all of that into actual data that they're producing to be able to reference that later. And if you have all these data pieces, you have the networking pieces, you have the user information, you kind of get all of that together into packaging that into an actual front end, which is what people usually interface with, and having that be reliable and consistent and not be beholden to one single web services provider Taking that away is a beautiful thing because not only is, uh, you kind of talked about the operating system. I feel like the better analogy is that it's actually another open internet that exists uh, for anybody to also discover the same things without relying on one single DNS resolver to decide one day that they don't care about this thing anymore. And effectively, censorship can be mitigated by having multiple copies of full-on stacks, whether it's contract, data, applications, and your JavaScript bundles all in the same place. Uh, so to me, this is personally super exciting. And uh, kind of my question to you is, well, seems like from what I understood, all of this is right now on Near, and you kind of said it's actually not specific to Near. So could you tell us more about how does this actually apply to any other blockchain? Can I run a Uniswap front end there in that world? Like, where is that interfacing with? How does it know which one is Ethereum, what's Near? Um, Tell us more about how this works with the rest of the world. Yeah, so, I mean, the general principle, right, that we're trying to follow is that everything is, is open source and everything is kind of componentized. And so you can pick whatever set of components you want for your own use case. And so in case of, you know, you wanting to... Um, what would be some components here? 
so the discovery is a fr is this like decentralized front ends component, right? So this is where you can build this front ends. Uh, you can build them for Uniswap, which already exists. You can build them right. for you know uh, Galaxy for uh, Ave. I just saw it actually. Uh, pop, somebody built it. Somebody built for one inch. I just retweeted that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm wearing one inch Oxford. Yeah, and so so you can build that for any network that kind of supported by the uh, web engine, the the thing that runs it. And so the idea there is, yeah, like it, it works with any um, blockchain already. The, for example, FastOS, right, and uh, is right now works on near and creates near accounts. But the next stage will be to kind of also create, so we call them like remote accounts on other chains. So you can start like as you onboard through this uh, funnel, you can start interacting on other chains as well. Directly from the web app. Directly from the web app, the same experience. You don't even know that you interact with other chain, right? Same with uh, kind of indexing framework, you know, kind of going to be integrating other uh, data indexes from other chains. So that such that as developer, you don't really care again on which chain it should be. You don't need to like change APIs. So just say like, hey, get me data, this kind of data from this contract on this chain, and it just pulls it up, right? And like, so underneath kind of all of these components need to just like play together and, and like be exp expandable and support any chain. Nice. How how do we think about data integrity in this world? Like, how do I know that the Uniswap front end I'm using is not malicious or the other person doesn't update it after? Um, how should we think about that? So the front end itself, I mean, it is stored on chain. So that's stored on near protocol and it uh, is signed, cryptographically signed. And so when you retrieve it, you have actually a proof from the blockchain that it's indeed this front end that you're looking at. So any future updates to that code will be stored on chain yeah so you can if you pull it up right now near the org and like you can go to develop mode and see the source code of the page you're looking at and you can go to history and see all the changes as well that's awesome and you can like if you fork in it or 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 using this in your own for example you're like hey this uniswap looks cool i want a mega swap right which has uniswap as part of it you can link to either specific version or the latest version as well or you can fork it and link to your own version it's awesome I, well, okay, so you kind of just... There'll be a workshop tomorrow that I'll I show you without, like, <laughs> me trying to explain. No more live demos. Um, <laughs> well, this is super cool because you've effectively made it easy for things to actually work on all devices, too, because now if I have portability on my desktop and mobile without having to have the same key copied, I get access to the same maps. Is that is that a good way to understand it? Exactly, yeah. You, I mean, but potentially this can be like rendered in command line, like for those who are like Emacs fans, like you can you can go into that mode as well. Like the idea is that the kind of the essence of the application is now like stored and, and the way you render it can be different, right? And so uh, the way you, it can be rendered into web, it can be rendered to mobile, it can be rendered to command line, it can be rendered into LED lights, right? Uh, <laughs> And uh, on, in turn as well, we actually just partnered with Orbit for those who are deep into the rabbit hole. And so Orbit is like kind of self-hosted, like when you actually have a server yourself. Um, the, or, the, the, the OG religion in this case. Yeah, OG religion, yeah. And so so th you can run that thing off Orbit as well and kind of have all your front ends, making sure they are all your own and nobody can affect them, right? So... so <laughs> I mean, that, that's incredible, actually. Uh, also, if you haven't noticed, I am learning live <laughs> what, what the features are, which is fascinating for me. Um, I want to ask one more question on this thing when I move on to a couple other topics that uh, that I feel like are, are worth kind of talking about because it's a shared theme on all the other interviews. Um, how does storage work in here? Like, does that sound super expensive to keep all this on chain? What's kind of the, the magic trick? Uh, well, the, this... The core trick is using history of the blockchain, which is way cheaper. I mean, it's the same trick. So you're that, doing parcel diffs of the next uh, data. Well, we actually we store right now the full, but the history is stored in 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 the history of the blockchain. So same as like so that's the cold that's data, more data instead of. Mm -hmm. But that that means there's even more data than you would want. Well, so a like. Because near is sharded, the uh, Jesse generally the storage is way cheaper than understood. Like and in general, the storage is not that expensive as was mentioned, uh, and so we don't have that limitation that uh, a single machine 
Uh, yeah, it's not a global. Everybody yeah. has to sync the same storage. And Got second it. is like for history, like we actually store it in the history of blockchain as well, which is uh, pretty, pretty robust and reliable and at the same time way cheaper. So like, you know, if you think of GitHub, right, GitHub actually has all the all the history of all the repos on top and they're replicated as well, right? And so right. like the cost there is, I mean, not maybe like five, seven X difference with what uh, near does so and it's not that much it goes down over time and goes down with the cost of yeah hardware that's super cool um i want to switch gears a little bit on just scalability altogether my question to you as somebody who is not in the ethereum or directly the flow ecosystem from at least today um, what are kind of your perspectives on layer twos um and if i were to kind of ask bluntly are layer two scaling from your perspective <laughs> so i i mentioned this right the Kind of the approach to scalability is, is all the same across everyone, right? It's like we need more machines to run stuff in parallel, and that's the only way to do it, like just physically. <laughs> well, the, sorry, the other one is bigger machines, uh, M more computers, either stacked up or yeah, stacked yeah. Up. And so, uh, so what layer two is right now, they they're done the first step, which is like okay, let's pull out the execution away from like consensus right so they said like hey we're going to run this execution machine and then we're going to settle on ethereum uh, which just adds latency for the ethereum and it doesn't really individual rollup doesn't scale yet right so if they need to scale the rollup they will need to actually implement sharding on the rollup side right so right now the way the scaling works is everybody says well let's run another rollup and Although it is indeed more stuff running in parallel, now it just becomes more complicated because, and from what we've seen so far, it's not like people say, hey, we're going to run, you know, Aave here and Uniswap there. It's like, we're going to run all the same stuff on every single rollup. Uh, and so again, not clear what we're scaling there. So from my perspective right now, like kind of there was a first step made, which is like, hey, we like kind of move the execution away from the consensus so we can easier do things, but it did not really scale because, and, and in turn, actually all these rollups that are now competing for block space actually driving prices for themselves up. And so it actually becomes more expensive because there are more rollups to run, to, to so like execute the only fight yeah. for being included. I see. So, so the, the solution is move everything to layer one. Well, so there's two solutions. Either say, okay, we're going to shard rollup. And so we'll, they will need to build the stuff we're building on the rollup side. And then, and then the, we'll need, the Ethereum needs to implement dunk sharding, which is data availability, which is again, what near done. Uh, <laughs> and so, so this will be a deconstructed near into multiple chains and you have like multiple tokens and, you know, uh, or you can like, yeah, collapse it into one integrated system and optimize it for latency and have like faster blocks and faster execution. So that that's a trade-off. And like, I mean, the Ethereum takes a trade-off that that it's better to have people experimenting and kind of having more of this alternatives of execution, which is is a initial position. Yeah. Uh, and we take the position that we can optimize more and deliver better latency and uh, better throughput through pretty much making some specific design choices around like which VM is running and how these things are tied together, but in turn give a better usability to the user and developer. Amazing. I, I'm going to go off a little bit tangent and then we'll come back to uh, our last question for today. Um, kind of from your perspective, what's kind of the overlap do you see between blockchains and AI? Yeah, so that's a good question. I've never been asked this before. That's a joke. Uh, yeah, so um, I think there's like, for on AI side, there's like kind of to understand the basics, right? AI is formed or like machine learning generally is formed from three concepts, right? There's data, uh, there's compute, and there is a model kind of architecture and uh, structure and ways of training. So what blockchains are really good at is marketplaces. They're really good at like creating liquidity for anything. And so... Uh, for the, each of these three things, there is actually right now a very limited availability of each of them. So if we're talking about data right now, 
if you want to get more training data, you need to go to Scale AI, talk to their salesperson, uh, you know, figure out how to get these things, you know, pay a lot of money and uh, uh, kind of start collecting data. And, you know, eventually it's low quality and you, you know, you need to fire Scale AI. You cannot fire like individual person who's working on that. And so uh, the kind of the first step there is like creating a marketplace for data cr for crowdsourcing. This is actually what we started with. Um, so then for compute, similar thing. If you want to compute, you actually need to go to Amazon, uh, potentially talk to their salesperson, you know, get a, get a commit uh, for like $7 million a year <laughs> if you want to do like AI properly. And uh, uh, so that's again, like something where we can have a compute marketplace. It is harder. There's like a lot of caveats around how that is done and requirements there. Um, but this is kind of conceptually and same for models, right? Right now, there's a lot of researchers, you know, investigating how to improve transformers. There's a lot of people kind of like, if you go to Hugging, hugging Face, there's a ton of stuff there uh, that people are experimenting with, but there's no like marketplace, right? There's no way to like request, hey, I want to model fine tune for this, or uh, there's no way to kind of um, also monetize models. If you like do make it, you either open source it or you close source it and give an API. Charge right. so, yeah. so there is a opportunity there to create a combination of something that's private that doesn't like leak all your data to some company and at the same time uh, give some uh, money to the developers this uh, model in in kind of like somewhere between open source and closed source pretty much like a new way and this is where you know people in research in ZKV ZK machine learning and other stuff but like kind of conceptually that is uh, a, a kind of a powerful place as well. No, that's pretty good. I think especially with like doing machine learning on private data without reading the data is is a, in a way, novel kind of thing that we were kind of just seeing at the beginnings of. Uh, I guess one thing I was curious about eh, from from uh, when I asked that question was understanding how do we actually think about authenticity of information? Because of course, marketplaces work on the side where somebody is contributing to these data sets, but how do I know if I got a, if I receive a message that's not generated from ChatGPT, or if I have all these deep fakes, or a voice message that just copies my voice after three seconds of input, that it is actually me and not some someone uh, faking something? So uh, I wanted to see if you kind of think about how does blockchain help with? Yeah. So this is the flip side of of like this was like how to use blockchain to do AI, and this is like how do we use blockchain to make sure our society doesn't fall apart? And <laughs> And so, yeah. so kind of fundamentally, our society runs on language, right? Everything you do from, you know, kind of creating a, a form, filing for your taxes, uh, you know, lawsuits, political messages, everything you do is language. And one thing that language models are really good at is at language. And this is the first time actually in computing where computers went from outputting something where you need a human to like interpret it and tell it to everybody else to the computer being able to communicate directly. And this is where all the flaws of our society are surfaced. It's not that AI is actually like breaking things. It's this is problems that exist it's before. The broken system is highlighting it. Yeah. It's just like the scale at which you can kind of now exploit it is tremendous, right? Generating a million page tax return that IRS is required to read, great spam the judiciary system with lots of uh, fake lawsuits, no problem, right? Create, yeah, fake voice messages from your friends, uh, like literally can be happening now. So all of this is like, again, exploiting the existing things. And so the, the point is we have cryptography and cryptography creates a very much like natural way to authenticate um, and link it to some identity. And so then uh, kind of, let's say, if we, you know, mandate that all the content generated needs to be cryptographically signed, now we can actually know where it's coming from. So right now, voice messages, by the way, are not signed. The whole, you know, all of telephone all, system, all of our not, communication, yeah, is communication signed. is not signed. your emails. And so, so the first thing to do is like we need to cryptographically sign it. Which, by the way, if you cryptographically sign it, you need to associate that cryptographic key with something. That's where PGP and GPG being like not great because it's been really hard to have this kind of registry of people and being able to exchange these keys. Well, that's where blockchain comes in. Blockchain is really good at actually having uh, kind of this reputation. And so you just need a good account abstraction to manage that. Um, and so this is where like 
where kind of all these pieces really coming together. And again, from our perspective, what we're doing with blockchain every system is trying to power a lot of that is like social kind of, we have a social component there, which is fully cryptographically signed. The front end is a cryptographic signed. Yeah, it's you a have great a default feature. Yeah. And you have, you can go to a user right now and see which everything from, you know, which transactions they did to which front ends they built to which posts they did, et cetera, right? So you can have now this powerful reputation being built, like which DAOs they participate, et cetera, to actually authenticate who are you uh, communicating with. Because the other problem is, sure, it can be signed, but then it can, like, obviously bots can create accounts and sign things. Uh, but you need to understand who is signed with. And then the next thing that we need is actually community governance. We need, I mean, to the uh, kind of point of previous speakers, we need community to be able to decide which things are, you know, kind of not appropriate in various ways, right? Uh, and uh, provide this kind of almost filters that users can apply on their communication, on their, uh, you know, way they read the internet, etc. And so this is where like blockchain is powering all that as a kind of really core infrastructure. There's a lot of pieces that need to come together, like content management systems and other pieces. Uh, probably browsers need to support that, like that when you read an article, it need to like validate that like, hey, this is not cryptographically signed or like, hey, the signature is from could be not Coindesk, yeah. Or like this quote is not signed. Like do you, re you realize right now quotes in articles are not like confirmed. The small screenshots are yeah. just edited. And so, so all of that, like we have now infrastructure to do that. We just need to like now build it into the stack and, and showcase to the, also to users that they need to care about. Like, I think the good example was the transition to SSL. Like, the fact that it was, like, you know, people starting caring that their lock, you know, on their browser is not, is, like, red. There was a time to convince people that your website must be HTTPS and you yeah. see the lock all of early 2000s and, uh, and now so it's... we need the same default. thing. Yeah. We need the same thing right now to happen, which is, like, the browsers need to show, like, hey, this page is not signed. You may be reading, like, or, like, this book is not signed. Like, books can be, like, fully generated. You may be reading completely different thing under the same title, right? You wouldn't even know. Textbooks, like imagine textbook that teaching kids like completely random stuff. Well, that's a scary world. Um, but, and to be clear, this is already <laughs> happening. This has been happening for hundred yeah, years. Yeah, it's like it's already happening. We're just pointing it out uh, live. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe let's find a way to end this. Is, um, is this live stream? <laughs> is, are people breaking society right now? Uh, not, not yet. In two weeks, it'll be up on YouTube. Uh, uh, <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll Photoshop this later. Um, deep fake it. There you go. Let's let me solve the problem with the problem. Um, well, my last question to you is what I've asked every other speaker. What does decentralization mean to you? For me, at the core is this um, kind of low to no cost of switch cost, right? Is like the, the fact that you're not locked in into the platform, be that like at, a, at any level, right? Be that the blockchain itself, the block producers, the uh, kind of the wallet that you're using, the RPC that you're using, like any any level of the stack, it should not be like this is the only place you can get this, and, it, and anywhere else you cannot. And I think I mean that's why like front ends like as as has been actually a lot so of part of the top most of right. So like how do we like replace kind of every level of stack is really important. But kind of for me conceptually and like. You know, if we go into AI, it's the same thing. Like, it should not be that OpenAI is the only place you can, you know, interact with ChatGPT and it gets all your data. Um, so, like, how how do we get to like on every stack, on every piece that you're not locked in? There's always the uh, kind of an alternative, and it's no cost to switch to that alternative. And I think, like, again, consensus is a really good example of that. Is like, it doesn't matter if one of the nodes goes away because, like, the the switch overall, is, yeah, is n nothing. So it's just not just the fact that you have the, well, you have an alternative option, is that it's also easy enough to yeah. be available at the same time for somebody to switch over? Yeah, because like you have alternative banks, but switching from one bank to another is pain in the ass, right? Like you have, alter and like if something happens with your bank, like you're screwed. So like here, you know, you, if you have switch, switch is ever, like kind of low switch cost, no switch cost everywhere. It also means that everyone is competing as hard as possible for your business, right? And which means like you have that drives perfect competition, which means like actually everything is like People really drive about the innovations are driving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ilya, this has been a wonderful chat. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. And.
Can't wait to see more BOS on the, the world.